And now we are in a whole new world of money printing and low interest rates. But when interest rates rise, just a small amount, it's going to be devastating. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 1,000 ounce silver bars for only 169 over spot per ounce with 90 day free storage. And 2021 one ounce silver Krugerrands for only 469 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is D David Quintieri, the author of The Money GPS. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. I'd really like to talk with you about inflation today because you've been reporting a lot about this and we've seen inflation just continue to rise and the Fed doesn't seem to be very concerned about it. But there's just strange things happening in the economy today and with consumer spending as well. You recently reported how used car prices are on the rise. And it's like a used car has it's not like that should be a, an appreciating asset. So your perspective on what we're seeing right now. So let's first talk about that, because, I mean, it's crazy. There's always this known fact when you take the brand new car off the lot, it's worth half its value. But now today, the cars are appreciating at 20, 30 percent. We're not talking about classic cars. We're not talking about muscle cars that have been fixed up and tuned up. We're talking about generic vehicles. So let's take it back further. Why is all of this happening? You know, the media and, and the analysts and everything, they love to point out there's a chip shortage, there's a, you know, bottlenecks, we've got supply chain problems. And yes, those are all true to some degree. But what about what the central banks are doing? They're devaluing the currency, they're reducing interest rates all the way down to the floor, and they are completely disrupting and dislocating all of what is normal. That's what started the problems in the first place. But people don't realize that because they're always focused on the day to day. So you've got things right now today that are going up in price that are surging astronomically. And then you look at just an example, what happened with lumber? The lumber price went through the roof and then it comes down just as fast as it went up. These are not normal factors. There's a lot of speculation behind it with what's happening. Of course, people try to take advantage of that. But at the same time, that hurts people because they're trying to renovate their homes, they're trying to build things, and it's completely ruining everything. And this is largely responsible uh, by the Federal Reserve and the other central banks around the world and their crazy monetary policies. In your mind, when did this start? Because you mentioned how this is not normal. I mean, it seems like that's kind of the catchphrase around COVID, right? How, you know, we just want things to go back to normal. And finally, it seems like, at least in s some parts of the country, they are. But when you talk about that this is not normal, what do you mean and how did that start? I think we really hit a new level back during the financial crisis where they said, we are not going to allow this financial zombie system to fail. And instead, we're going to bail everybody out. Once they did that, they entered a whole new era of allowing these big, terrible corporations to exist, to continue to exist. That's where we're at today. So you go further into 2020, and there was absolutely, truly no reason for the Federal Reserve to be buying $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities and $80 billion of treasuries to fix the problems that the country had. There is no reason. There is no possible way that you could associate the two. It didn't make any sense. But they said, you know, we want to do our part. Now they're talking about fixing the climate. Are you going to print money to fix the climate? I mean, it's a joke. This is the thing that we've been encountering for a, a long time now. And now we are in, in a whole new world of money printing and low interest rates. But when interest rates rise, just a small amount, it's going to be devastating. And when do you expect those interest rates to rise? Because I believe the, the Fed said 2023. But do you see them raising interest rates sooner? Right. So <laughs> they keep on talking about transitory, temporary. But now we've already heard Janet Yellen 
And I think it was Kaplan from the Federal Reserve talk about, well, actually, you know, this is not going to be so temporary. It's going to be, uh, you know, a little, you know, maybe a, a year and a half. Actually, it was Neil Kashkari who said, you know, this could be 18 months of high inflation. Janet Yellen said expect it for a few years. So we're talking about people who, you know, the information doesn't correspond. Who do we believe? But ultimately, when I see it right now today, the, in, the inflation rates are so unbelievably high. And if you look at what happened back from the 1970s up until the present, 1970s, you had the official inflation rate just started to take off. And you could see inflation came down on their statistics. But if you look at the prices that we pay, that never slowed down. So real inflation never stopped. And guess what? I know you know it. Back in 1971, there's kind of an important date. Once they lifted off the gold standard, once they got rid of that, all hell has broken loose. And this shows us that what they do, what they do is destroy and devalue the currency to hit you at home, hit you in your wallet. People talk about how, yeah, it really does hit our wallets more than the officials say it does in a lot of respects. So the CPI says, you know, 5.4% inflation for June. But in reality, a lot of people argue that it's higher than that. And, and we're feeling that it's higher than that. So your perspective on really where inflation is right now. That's a difficult one. I mean, you could look at shadow stats. You can look at different sources. I would say that it depends on, you know, for instance, if you're using the healthcare system to a great degree, then maybe you know your healthcare prices are higher, therefore your inflation is higher because those have really increased. Um, maybe if you're going to school, uh, you got to pay higher prices on the school, so it would affect you more. I think the number is kind of more of like a range, but I do definitely think it is much higher than what they suggest, simply because they can modify it as they desire. You know, it, it's something like if you were eating steak then you know they're going to suggest that no no now you're going to eat ground beef because the steak is too expensive now ground beef is too expensive you're going to start eating spam meanwhile you're going to be eating dog food by the time that this thing is over and they're going to be suggesting that you know this is all the same they, they, they manipulate it they, they totally do and we all know that but i think what what we need to realize here is that when you look at the actual basket of goods that you have your food your energy your clothing whatever that you need your shelter how much have the prices of these things been increasing? And you can do a rough calculation on your own. And I think you'll come up with a pretty shocking statistic. And if we kind of try to step back and understand where this is inflation is coming from, you mentioned there was really a shift from normalcy back in 2008. That's kind of when it started. And really, we saw the money supply increase incredibly. You know, the base money supply went up, you know, fivefold or so, four, fourfold. And even since the COVID crisis, we've seen the base money supply go from about four trillion to seven trillion, and it just keeps going higher. So, your perspective, it seems like you know we didn't see a lot of inflation from two thousand eight to you know twenty twenty, but now we're starting to see the inflation. Why has there? Why is it now that we're starting to see this inflation? You know, it takes a lot of time for it to move through the system, and there's no telling where this comes and goes from. But I think that if you look at the examples in the past, uh, Weimar Germany and, and others, what always happens in these cycles is that when people naturally feel that their money is losing value, they don't necessarily know it because they're looking at the inflation rate or because it's a, it's a known fact or something. But once they feel that, they start to rush to buy things. They buy a new big home. They renovate their home. They buy a new car. They start to really get anxious in wanting to spend their cash because they realize the borrowing is so cheap. The stuff is expensive, but I'll buy it today so that I don't have to buy it tomorrow. And it's this flight out of cash, out of currency, because of course they know inherently that it has no value. So I think that that's what you get at the end of any cycle. How much longer the cycle is, I don't know, but things would just get worse until it pops. And how do people take action? You know, we can't just passively watch this happen, right? We have to actually take action and protect ourselves against this inflation. So there are a few things that you can do. When you're talking about food prices, one very simple thing is that you can buy in bulk. 
So you can be, for example, you know, you got storable food. You could buy storable food, canned food, huge bags of rice. You can buy, uh, you know, big containers of beans and lentils and all these different things that you lock in the price today. Plus, you're buying in bulk, so you save money there. You can grow a garden. You can grow sprouts indoors. These are just simple things, of course, but it does make a difference. You can eat at home instead of eating at the restaurants because the restaurants increase their price dramatically. I don't know if anybody else has seen this, but you go to the restaurant, same exact meal you used to order previously, but now it's 20%, 30% higher. Why? Because they got to pay their staff more. They've got shortages. They got problems. They're, they're charging uh, people more. Okay. So eating at home obviously is going to save you some money there too. But on the monetary side, on the financial side, you should be really watching out what happens because if your portfolio is overexposed to growth, to risk, I think that's going to be an issue. So there's something called risk parity, which Ray Dalio has his all weather portfolio that is essentially what he considers to be more diversified. OK, and you can look at that. That's something. But I would suggest that people should be diversifying against all different types of potential futures. This is something that you could do uh, very simply, number one, to include precious metals in your portfolio. I mean, can't believe how many people don't have precious metals in their portfolio. And it's a portfolio. You don't have to think of it 100% in this or 100% in this. It should be inclusive. You should be able to do that and hedge against inflation this way. Speaking of people's portfolios, a lot of people, you know, have a lot in the stock market, for example, but there's arguments to be made that it's incredibly overvalued right now. So what are your what's your perspective on this? It seems like the traditional way to diversify would be stocks, bonds and maybe a tiny bit of precious metals. But it seems like in this day and age, a different ratio might be advantageous. Obviously, we can't give financial advice, but it seems like we're in a different time right now. That's absolutely true. Right now, you look at the valuations of stocks and it's just crazy. Some would say, OK, get out of uh, or trim your winnings from, you know, Amazon stock and, and this and that and put it into more defensive plays. But I think we're still in this whole field of, you know, ridiculously overpriced assets. So certainly you look at precious metals, they have been underperforming in relation to like tech stocks, for instance, they've done well overall, I think gold has done reasonably well, but nothing in comparison to like what real estate has done and, and what stocks have done. So these things, you know, the way it works through any cycle is that you as an individual, you got to put your money where it is undervalued at that time. In terms of ratios, hard to really, um, to be precise, but throughout periods, whenever there is undervaluation, that's where you apply more of your capital. And when something is overvalued, you may decide to, you know, reduce that in percentage terms. So you may not necessarily even need to sell something, but as you gain more capital, maybe from your nine to five job, where you're going to put it is where it's undervalued at that time. So this is all dependent on what you want to do and so on. But I think people should be paying much closer attention to how their portfolio is built and not necessarily focused on where can I get the highest appreciation because money is actually made over a long period of time in not losing money. It's not just how much can I gain today? It's how can I not lose money over a period of time and gain over that over that duration? In your perspective, then, when investing in different assets that are going to you know, protect your wealth, is there any specific ratio you feel like with gold and silver that, you know, in your in your view is the best? In between those two, if, if that's what you're suggesting, gold and silver, um, out of complete ignorance, I would say 50 50. Now, why is that? Why do I say that? There's a lot of individuals who would say, you know, the best growth potential is definitely in silver. So you should put more into silver. There are others who would say because of what central banks are doing, they're buying and the fact that there's a you know the devaluation of the currency, gold will outperform. I think that in either scenario, both are going to do well. So in that respect, a 50-50 split is probably, you know, like I said, out of ignorance is probably just the safest bet. Now, if one is you know, 55 or 60 or something like this, I don't think it matters too much. We don't know what the future has in store, and one is gonna outperform the other, we know that. 
But I would just say that for most people, the easiest thing to do is to have both. That's all. And in fact, there's also platinum and palladium too. These are other precious metals, but to a lesser degree because uh, historically they haven't been used as money, uh, like anywhere near what we would say with uh, gold and silver. So, but I, but I think those should be considered too. I know there's a strong argument for platinum right now because it's under the price of gold, which is pretty rare. What is your view on platinum? I think, like I said, like in general, it's, you know, when you look at the precious metals as a whole, they should all be considered. Um, in, in terms of the current price, yeah, there, you got to remember, like when you look at all different commodities, there's the price and the value of the actual metal, but there's the futures price. And what you see, like, for example, with gold and silver, we know they should be much higher. We, we know that, but they've been suppressed. So it all depends on how much energy is being put behind that suppression. And like for the price of lumber, did it ever really need to be at 1700 Probably not, but there's a lot of speculation behind it. And these traders and so on push that price up to new heights. So I think that people should be a, a little less specific about everything and simply think to themselves, what can I do right now? If the price is low historically, let's apply some capital to that and just not be so um, calculated and, and be more you know, intuitive about it. Now, David, thank you so much for your time today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where people can find you online? Absolutely. So I think for most people, the solution here when we're talking about inflation or deflation, in fact, is that we need to get ahead of the game. We need to realize that they're not going to be, you know, putting sirens up and, and there's going to be all this warning of something catastrophic to occur. You need to make all of your adjustments today. If that means growing a garden, if that means having precious metals, if that means readjusting your portfolio to be a little bit more safe and secure, to include something that you know is uh, historically safe and sound versus something that is um, you know, gonna maybe it's gonna skyrocket tomorrow, a meme stock or what have you, then make all these adjustments now. You do that now so that you can sleep well at night. So I just think that, that that's kind of the most important thing. It's all about uh, being smart with what you do with your money on all levels and all things in life. If you want to find me, you can do that at my YouTube channel, The Money GPS. I'm posting videos every day, so I hope to see you there. Fantastic. David, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you. This week's specials with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 1,000 ounce silver bars for only 169 over spot per ounce with 90 day free storage. And 2021 one ounce silver Krugerrands for only 469 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.